Today we're going to be closing out the book of Joshua. We'll be studying out chapters 23 and 24. The title of our lesson is simply, The General's Last Charge. Our three points are simply, Leadership carries the day. Choose this day. And number three, the end of days. Let's turn to first to Joshua. Chapter 23. We read this in the first two verses. After a long time had passed and the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies around them. Joshua, by then old and well advanced in years, summoned all Israel, their elders, leaders, judges, and officials, and said to them, I am old and well advanced in years. I like the King James Version. He says, I am waxed old and stricken with age. Maybe you felt like that when you got out of bed this morning. It literally says that he was advanced in days. Advanced in days. In verse 14, in the middle of this charge, he says, Now I'm about to go the way of all earth. He knew he was dying. Here is the general. The Bible says in chapter 24, he is 110 years old. In chapters 23 and 24, we in fact find two last charges that he gives the people of Israel. Chapter 23, he talks to the leaders because he knows that the leadership of God's people is the ceiling of their spirituality. Then in chapter 24, he addresses all the people of Israel at Shechem. Can you imagine? He asked the leaders to come, the elders, the judges, and the officials. They come to where he lived, in Timnasera, in the hill country of Ephraim. And you know, there was a lot of wisdom in this aged warrior. He wanted them to come to him, not because he was old and frail, but he wanted them to come to Timnasera to be able to see for themselves that the hill country could be conquered. We remember from our last study, there were many, there were many parts of the promised land that still had be conquered. And excuses had already come into the people of God about why you could not conquer, in particular, the hill country. And so this wise and advanced in days general says, I want all the leaders to come to Timnah, Sarah, to the hill country of Ephesus. And I want you to see for yourselves that our God is faithful to his promises to give us the promised land. Can you imagine the leaders probably gathered not far from his house? And when the time came, the general comes out of his home. A hundred and ten years old. Knowing he's going to die. You know, there's something about death that purifies every human soul. And so he is coming for what he knows to be the last time that he is going to address all the leaders of the people of God of that day. And I sense there would have been confidence in his step. That there would have been a sense of he was about to proclaim to them the will of God as he passed the torch of leadership on. We read on with these words. He says in verse 3, You yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you. Remember how I have allotted as an inheritance for your tribes all the land of the nations that remain. The nations I conquered between the Jordan and the Great Sea in the West. 
The Lord your God himself will drive them out of your way. He will push them out before you and you will take possession of their land as the Lord your God promised you. Well, right here, not surprisingly, he reminds them of the military victories. He reminds them about, hey, we've allotted out the promised land. You have seen it happen. And then because the conquering of the promised land was a gradual subduing of the land, he gives them a promise and reminds them by faith, the Lord your God will drive out these enemies of God. You can be sure of that. And then, very interestingly, we read these words. Be very strong. Wow. Now, where have we heard those words before? (laughs) Joshua chapter 1. They are the words of God to Joshua. And now, at the end of his days, he comes before his leaders. And he says to them, you be very strong. You be very vigorous. You be strong and courageous. And this is what every great leader does. He passes on the word of God as was given to him. And he calls his leaders to the same commitment that he has. Wasn't this the power of the movement of Jesus? That Jesus, though calling us imperfect people to him, he expected us to have his commitment to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength to be willing to die for the cause. I love the words of uh, Steve Johnson's song from the Upside Down musical in talking about the day of Pentecost. And the line goes, and now there's not just one to kill. There are 3,000 Jesuses. (laughs) That's the expectation of Jesus. It's the expectation of every great leader that his men and his followers would follow his example of total commitment to God. He says, be very strong. Be careful to obey all that's written in the book of the law of Moses without turning aside to the right or to the left. Do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them, but you are to hold fast to the Lord your God as you have until now. The Lord has driven out before you great and powerful nations. To this day, no one's been able to withstand you. One of you routes a thousand because the Lord your God fights for you just as he promised. So be very careful to love the Lord your God. But if you turn away and ally yourself with the survivors of these nations that remain among you, and if you intermarry with them and associate with them, then you may be sure that the Lord your God will no longer drive these nations out before you. Instead, you will become, they will become snares and traps for you, whips on your back and thorns in your eyes until you perish From this good land, which the Lord your God has given you. Now, I'm about to go the way of all earth. You know with all of your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises of the Lord your God gave you have failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. Man, can can you imagine being one of the leaders there and you seeing a 110-year-old warrior saying, Be strong! Be courageous! God has never failed you. Now you don't fail God. We find right here in verse 10, a very interesting phrase. He says to them very inspirationally, one of you rests a thousand because the Lord, your God fights for you just as he promised. You see, all the guys, all the leaders would have known that was from the Song of Moses. Let's go on over there and see what that little line comes from. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Everybody knew the Song of Moses. Whether they could sing or not, they knew the words. And in verse 30 of chapter 32, we find this reference. In the song, how could one man chase a thousand or two put ten thousand to flight? Unless their rock had sold them. Unless the Lord had given them up. See, he was referencing the greatness of God's people. He was talking to leaders and he says, God expects great things of you. One of you can ride a thousand. But it isn't because you're great in and of yourself. It's because of the Lord your God that you serve. Because if you're faithful to God, one of you routes a thousand. Is that awesome, guys? 
They knew the song. They just need to live out the lyrics. How often in church do we sing the songs and fail to live out the lyrics? You can tell by a church when it sings where their heart is at. When they sing about going to Canaan's land. When they're singing about, I'll fly away. You know if that church believes what they're singing. Are you with me right here? And you can always tell where an individual's at. By their heart and their song or their lack of a song. In verse 8 of chapter 23, he says, But you are to hold fast to the Lord your God as you have until now. That is the same Hebrew word. That's found in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, when it talks about how you are to leave your mom and dad and to cleave to your wife. It's the word cleave. Hold fast. And so right here, there's a reference to the kind of intimate relationship that God desires. I mean, there's, there's nothing more intimate than husband and wife, is there not? And so right here, he says, you are to hold fast to the Lord your God. You are to be intimate with the Lord your God. You are to cleave to the Lord your God. And then he says in verse 12, But if you turn away and ally yourselves with the survivors of these nations that remain among you, and if you intermarry with them and associate with them, then they will become snares and traps and whips on your back and thorns in your eyes. The word ally is exactly the same word right here. As Genesis chapter 2, 24, as well as in verse 8. It is to cleave. He says, you've got a choice. You can either cleave to God and have that intimate relationship. Or you can cleave to the world. You've got a choice. And I find it very interesting right here. That one of the great snares that Joshua saw was intermarriage to people that were not of faith. He says, this will take you out. This will take you out. You know, we all know the scripture, but let's go over there anyway to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians in chapter 6 and verse 14. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God himself said, I will live with them and walk amongst them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Now, right here, these actually are scriptures quoted from the Old Testament. And yes, you know, we uh, we grasp on to the plea to be a New Testament church. Why? Because there wasn't one in the Old Testament. But really, what a lot of people do is they try to explain away this passage, the marrying of disciples to sold out disciples, because of their biblical ignorance. If one knows the Old Testament, then you can fully understand the New Testament. If you do not take the time to get into the Bible and to know your Old Testament, you're not going to understand so much of what was written in the New Testament. Let's go back and look at what the Old Testament said about intermarriage. Now, remember, Joshua said, hey, it's going to break the covenant of God. Let's look what happened to Solomon. First Kings chapter 11. In verse one, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their God. So does this parallel the passage in Joshua? Absolutely. Let's read on right here. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his hearts after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Asherah, the goddess of Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely, as David his father had done. 
on a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built the high place of Chemos, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all of his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifice to their god. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's commands. Intermarriage was a serious issue. In fact, there were few other issues held as serious in the Old Testament. The Bible says because marriage is the most intimate human relationship we can have. The Bible says when you marry outside of the faith, it will turn your heart away from full devotion to God. Let's see in the book of Nehemiah what Nehemiah did about the problem. Remember, we're trying to understand, do not be yoked with unbelievers. we got to get a conviction right here. In Nehemiah, chapter 13, Nehemiah is trying to turn the people's hearts back to God. And he says in verse 23, Moreover, in the days I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Astad or the language of one of the other peoples and did not even know how to speak the language of Judah. That's how much the moms or the dads had influenced their children away from Jehovah God. Verse 25. I rebuked them and called curses down on them. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. I made them take an oath in God's name and said, you are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to take daughters in marriage for your sons or for yourselves. Was it not because of marriages like these that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Was it not because of marriages like these that the king of Israel sinned? Among the many nations, there was no king like him. He was loved by his God and God made him king over all Israel. But even he was led into sin by foreign women. Must we hear now that you two are doing all this terrible wickedness and are being unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women? Wow. That is how serious an issue it was. And we as a church got to get a conviction. If we are to have an intimate relationship with God, then our most intimate human relationship has got to be with another disciple. Are you with me right here, guys? You know, I was I was so encouraged just a couple of weeks ago. uh, I got a message from uh, Maxim Potapov, who leads our church over in Kiev, Kiev, Ukraine. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd been talking to Maxim. I said, you know, dude, you got to stay pure. you got to stay strong. And, you know, for a while he was saying, well, we just have really a pretty small church. There's only about 70 disciples. And I, I don't know if I see anybody. Well, he finally opened his eyes and saw his co-leader, Natasha. And they're getting married next Sunday. Is that awesome? <laughs> you know, for a lot of disciples, we are so hung up on the human things. That we can't see what's most important and what's most... What makes a woman beautiful is her love for God. What makes a guy handsome is his love for God. What are you searching for? Where are your convictions about what it means to live for God? The Bible says that when you marry outside of faith, you have in fact sinned and broken your covenant relationship with God. That's how serious of an offense it was. See, when you understand the Old Testament... It brings even more power into your reading of the New Testament. Amen, guys? Our first point is clear. Leadership carries the day. You see, Joshua understood, I've got to get these leaders to have my same convictions. To love God. To be strong and very courageous. And then they can call the people to that standard. And we, as disciples, we have got to have the same conviction. That we all must have the same exact commitment of Jesus Christ. How serious was that? Serious enough to travel two hours from Palm Springs to come here to get restored? Serious enough to quit a job? Yeah, serious enough to die. When you got baptized in New Testament times, you didn't know whether you were seen the next day. It was a huge decision. We have made it so trifle in our day. So trivial. And yet the call to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ is no different today than when Jesus walked the earth. And we've got to 
get a conviction. Leadership carries a day. Not because leaders in and of themselves are so great, but because they believe in the promises of God and call the people to remember that God has never failed in any one of his promises. Amen. Well, that was his charge there in the book of Joshua, chapter 23. And that was to the leaders. And now the Bible says in chapter 24, verse 1, Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and then presented themselves before the Lord. Our second point is, choose this day. You know, this is the last renewal of the covenant, of course, in Joshua's time. And the question comes, and even some scholars have questioned, well, why didn't they do this at Shiloh? Some have even changed some of the later manuscripts to put Shiloh on in, but Joshua was a pretty wise warrior. The question comes, why Shechem? Of all places in the promised land, Why, for the last meeting with the people of God, go to Shechem? Well, the answer lies in the book of Genesis. Turn to Genesis chapter 12. Where we read the initial story of our father of faith. Abram, at that time, later, Abraham. Remember that God promises in verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I'll show you. I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, that's a cranking destiny. Amen, guys? Verse 4. So Abram left. As the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old. Hey, it's never too late to fulfill your destiny. Hear that, Marty Wooten? (laughs) Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled to the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were living in land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. What happened at Shechem? It was where God first spoke to him at the promised land. By that tree in Shechem. He built an altar there. It was the place that he worshipped. This was the promised land he had, he had promised to Abram. The very first place was Shechem. Well, other things happened. Shechem, we turn to Genesis chapter 35. We move on into the time of Jacob. And we read in verse 2. So Jacob said to his household and all that were with him, Get rid of the foreign gods you have with you, and purify yourself and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel, where I will build an altar to the Lord, who answered me in the day of my distress, and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in their ears. And Jacob burned them under the oak at Shechem. Wow. Wow. What the trees have witnessed. (laughs) There's that tree again. So what happens right here? Well, Shechem was already special because that was the place that Abram had first worshipped God in the promised land. And now as Jacob tries to purify his people. He says, okay, guys, get rid of all your idols. Get rid of all your materialism. And let's bury them here at Shechem, where Abraham first made his vow. Remember a few weeks ago in Joshua chapter 8, the blessing of Mount Gerasim and Mount Ebal's curses. Well, where's that? Shechem. It's where Joshua himself had the men pile up a bunch of rocks, put plaster on them, and written the entire law of God into that plaster. And you remember how the people, one half the people were on Mount Ebal and pronounced the curses of God, and the other half the people were on Mount Gerasim and pronounced the blessing of God? Well, that's where he went back to. He wanted to inspire the people. He wanted the people to remember that they were worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God that had brought them through 
the promised land. And very interesting, we find in chapter 24 of Joshua, it was the place, the final resting place of Joseph's bones, the Savior, so to speak, of the Hebrew people. They buried him at Shechem. And so can you imagine for a moment, the leaders have met with Joshua. Joshua has told them, I'm about to die. Now gather the people at Shechem. Bring everybody. Now you got to understand, this had not happened for a long time. Because remember, the Transjordan tribes had left their wives and children in the cities that they conquered before they crossed the Jordan. So now he's saying, you bring everybody. You bring the men. You bring the women. You bring the children. And we are going to gather at Shechem. And the leader said, you got to come. He's dying. These are his last words. The general's final charge. So what did he say? Well, let's read on. Verse 2, chapter 24. Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your forefathers, including Terah and the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the river and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the river and led him through Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac. And to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country of Seir to Esau. But Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses in there and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there and brought you out. When I brought your fathers out of Egypt, you came to the sea. And the Egyptians pursued them with chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea. But they cried to the Lord for help and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea over them and covered them. You saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians. Then you lived in the desert for a long time. I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived east of Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them before you. And you took possession of the land. When Balak, son of Zippor, the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent for Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse on them. But I wouldn't listen to Balaam, so he blessed you again and again. And I delivered you out of his hand. Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Gergesites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. But I gave them into your hands. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you. Also the two Amorite kings. You didn't do it with your own sword and bow. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil, and cities which you did not build, and you lived in them. And ate from the vineyards and the olive groves that you did not plant. Wow, can you imagine it? The people are gathered once more on the mountains. And here comes General Joshua. (laughs) Got to be riding a white horse. (laughs) The old man gets off. He stands in the middle of the valley. And he relates the history of God's people. Why do you think the Bible has so much history? It's to remind us that the same God of old is the God of today and the God of forever. And he went through what God had done, speaking in the first person for God. And he ends and he says, hey, you came to a place where cities you did not build, you live in. Vineyards you did not plant, you drink from. This is the place I promised you. A land of milk and honey. And then here's his charge in verse 14. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose yourselves this day whom you will serve. Will the gods of your forefathers serve beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living? But as for me and my household, we 
will serve the Lord. It surprises people, but as we go into the book of Judges next week, you will find that already idolatry had come into the Israelites. As a matter of fact, in chapter 17, we find the story of Micah. And by chapter 20, we see that Phineas is still alive in the book of Judges. So even under the leadership of Mr. Zeal himself, Phineas, there was idolatry. And right here, Joshua calls it out. He says, I know there's idolatry in your hearts. He says, but here's the thing. I don't really care what you do or you don't do. But as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. How different that is than so many people. We look to the right. We look to the left to see what everybody else is doing to see if it's okay to be committed. We want to be PC in our words. We want to be PC in our life. Instead of saying, oh, I just want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. As for me and my house. We will serve the Lord, period. Period. Now look what happens. I I find this a little bit humorous. Verse 16. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us up and our fathers up out of Egypt from the land of slavery and performed these great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey. And among the nations to which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who live in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. He's holy. He's a jealous God. See, the whole concept of cleaving right there. He says, God's not going to take 50% commitment. He's a jealous God. Who of you would accept your wife to say, well, I've only messed around with one or two guys this year. And see, men don't get it when they get into pornography and their wives are kicked off. Why? Because she senses that pulling away from her and that intimate relationship. It's why women get far more ticked off at that kind of stuff than us. Us men, we try to rationalize it. Well, guys are going to be guys. That's the God. He is a holy and jealous God. It's him or nothing. Let's read on. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. He will forsake the Lord and serve other foreign gods. He will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he's been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, no, no, no. We will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, you are witnesses against yourselves. That you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, yes, we're witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. Is that cranking or not? He was not one of these guys that took lightly. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to serve the Lord. He says, no, I don't believe you're going to do it. No, 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 we're going to do it. He says, yeah, we're going to do it. He says, no. See, this God is a holy and jealous God. No, no, we want to be faithful all our lives. He says, then get rid of the idols. Get rid of the idols. See, the general brought them to Shechem. To remember the covenant of old. To remember their forefather Abraham had worshipped and heard the Lord there. To remember that Jacob had put away the idols under that tree. And the materialism that went with it. He brought him there to remember the blessing and curses about Jerusalem and Mount Ebal. He brought him there one more time to remember even the bones of Joseph. And to say, listen, God has saved you. Now get rid of the idols. Choose this day whom you will serve. If it's undesirable for you to serve, Lord, go your way. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Would that have stirred your heart if you were there? I believe that Joshua is speaking to us from the grave. And he is saying, if serving the Lord is undesirable for you, go your way. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
And, and, and you sense this, 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 this peace about the general. That this decision that he made early on in his youth, that he followed through as he went into the promised land and brought Moses one of only two good minority reports. This conviction made at an early age was one that he kept through the ages. And now he spoke with a calmness, with a sense of conviction that only staring death in the face can bring. And so we read, verse 25, On that day Joshua made a covenant for the people, and there at Shechem he drew up for them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak tree near the holy place of the Lord. There's that cotton-picking oak tree. Is that incredible? What that oak tree had seen through the years. It's kind of interesting. In verse 25, it says, On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people. The word made there in Hebrew is literally cut. That became an expression, an idiom. Why? Because covenants were cut. Circumcision is a cutting. Remember when Moses brought down the Ten Commandments? A second, well, the first time it was written by the finger of God. Second time he made Moses write them. He had to cut them. And of course then, on Mount Ebal was the cutting into the plaster. The very law of God. And so this became a phrase. To cut a covenant. And the Bible says that he drew up for them the decrees and the laws. And he recorded these things in the book of the law of Moses. This becomes the beginning of the book of Joshua. Becomes a part of the inspired writ. Then the Bible says he takes a large stone and he sets it. Isn't this amazing? Sets it up there under the oak. Well, why? Why there? Because it's the same tree as Abraham and Jacob. He places it there. It's very specific. Everybody knew the story. And he says, when you see this tree and you see this stone, you will remember the covenant that you renewed here at Shechem. You know, to renew a covenant is powerful. Many years ago, the Lord put upon Elena's my heart to plant a church in Manila, Philippines. And we felt that the way to go was to have a group of young Filipino people go with us. And we put the word on out, but, but few came. And so I decided we'd go around to different churches and trying to find young Filipino people that would be willing to go back to Manila to plant God's church. And what I found, even though these Filipino Brothers and sisters had become disciples. They were still grabbing a hold of the Filipino dream. Which was to come to America and have the American dream. And what they needed to be inspired to do was to renew the covenant. And to live for Jesus' dream. I can still remember the meeting in San Francisco. We talked about it. We talked about you've got to go back. This is what it's all about. So how did you choose? The people that cried. That's how we chose. They were that humbled before a holy God. We took that team of 26 Filipino people. And it was incredible. In the first year of that planting, the Lord blessed us with 400 baptisms. You see, when you get a group of people that renew the covenant of God to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to bury those idols and the earrings. (laughs) You find a group of people that are literally unstoppable. Why? Because the hornet goes out. You say, well, in the Bible, was it like a real, like powerful little Jehovah hornet? 
Now, it's an expression, but there was something to it. You find it in the book of Exodus. You find it referenced also in the book of Deuteronomy. I think that most of us have been around bees or wasps before. But one of the things that my brother and I used to love to do was to go to wasp nests and take stones and try to wipe them out. Now, if you're smart, you throw the stone, you don't bother watching whether it hits or not. Because they're coming after you. And, you know, I mean, I remember this one time, Randy hung around. <laughs> and he got the hornet. <laughs> and I am, I am tearing out of there. Because the hornet is frightening. And yet, they're only about this big. And so the kind of reaction, what the Lord did, is he put a fear into the people in front of the Israelites. He put a fear that made them go crazy. The Israelites are coming. The hornet of God leads them. You know, I believe with all of my heart that what's happening here in the cities of Angels Church is a renewing of the covenant. It was awesome seeing Samir get on up here. Oh, Lord's blessed them. This is a 23-year-old young man who started out cleaning toilets a few years ago and now has his own business and making six figures. But you know something? In that was no fulfillment. To see him today, when I came on in, this huge smile because he had renewed the covenant. To renew the covenant. You know, I believe there are many in the audience today that still go to church, but you've got your household idols. You've got earrings that may be around your finger ring or just maybe called a house. And it's kind of interesting. I went to visit one former minister when I went home because I got to see my parents as well as Elena's parents this week. And it's kind of interesting. I went to this house. I'm telling you, Better Homes and Garden doesn't have a cranking house like this. <laughs> and it's kind of interesting to me. Now that he was no longer in the ministry, it was okay to be materialistic. You know, it's, it's amazing how warped people's sense of commitment has become. See, if we're going to be a people that evangelize the world in our day, and I believe that's the promise of God, then we've got to be a people that have that same pure commitment that when we came out of the waters of baptism. Elisa, it's going to be great for her to get baptized today. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty awesome in a way. We, you know, we just have uh, Mike Underhill and Rachel Bond just started leading the teens this past week. They had their first teen meeting Saturday night, and they had 10 teenagers out. Is that awesome? And, uh, you know, Darian's our only baptized teen, but now he's going to, we're going to double today. And, you know, it's, it's awesome because Mike just six weeks ago got restored to the Lord. And now he's calling others. See, I really believe that even some of us here in the City of Angels Church have come down to Portland Mission Team. It's time to renew your vow. It's time to choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of the world or the gods of lukewarmness or Jehovah God. That is a holy and jealous God. I believe there are many people here that, that, that have fallen away from God. And you may or may not attend church. You know what a pure commitment of God is. Today is a day to choose. There are some here that have never entered the waters of baptism. And you say, well, I just need to know more. I just need to know more. Hey, you're never going to be perfect enough to be baptized. That's why you're getting baptized. Is <laughs> to get rid of all your imperfection. 
It's time this day to choose. Are you with me right here? Let's close out our study. In chapter 24, kind of in the epilogue in verse 28. The title of this point, The End of Days. Then Joshua sent the people away, each to his own inheritance. After these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnasera, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua, and the elders who outlived him, and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. And Joseph's bones, which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the track of land that Jacob brought for a hundred pieces of silver from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. This became the inheritance of Joseph's descendants. And Eleazar, son of Aaron, died and was buried at Gibeah, which had been allotted to the son Phinehas in the hill country of Ephraim. Right here at the close of the book, we find the two great leaders of God's people, Joshua and Eleazar, die. And sadly, we're going to find next week that with the loss of this kind of leadership that pointed people to God, the Israelites enter an age of darkness. You know, it was very interesting going back this week and uh, being there for Elena's dad's 80th birthday. And it was cool because the kids were back, five kids, and all the grandkids. And it was, it was really awesome because we all gathered in this, this, this little room at this restaurant. And it was, a, it was a fun time. People were sharing. I mean, it was great. I found out some stories about Elena that I didn't even know. I mean, I never knew that she used to sneakily slide off her vegetables off the plate into her napkin. And then her father had to regularly say, Elena, can we see your napkin? Then you can be excused. There's some other stories, but I, I want to make sure Elena and I cleave when we leave. But I mean, there's some crazy stories. You know, Ignacio's a big man. In his day, he was about 6'3", and he came across as kind of the hardline father type. And it was a very moving story. they just come in from Cuba. They're, they were immigrants, political refugees from Cuba. And the dad got his first new car. And he loved this new car. And he was being very generous when he let his three oldest children, Nick, Carmen, and Elena, get milkshakes. Nick got a chocolate one. Carmen, a strawberry. And Elena, ever conscious of her weight, got vanilla. <laughs> And like all fathers with a new car, don't spill anything. (laughs) Well, Nick spilled his chocolate. (laughs) Carmen spilled her strawberry. And yes, Elena dumped the entire vanilla. (laughs) And of course, they were all deathly afraid of Papa. But instead of taking him out, they... (laughs) He loved up on him. Now, the car had kind of a funky smell for the rest of its days, but that was Ignacio. And it was so awesome to hear the children, the grandchildren share about him. And then at the end, he spoke. Now, just a couple months ago, he had very serious back surgery, and we didn't know whether he was going to be around very much longer. And when an 80-year-old speaks... People listen. You you could have heard a pin drop. Because there is a sense that anybody that's old, and yes, in some ways, facing the grave, whatever they're going to say has been totally purified by things they've gone through. You know, before we went there, I spent a couple days with my mom and dad. And they'll turn 80 next year. And on one of the days, I went to go visit my grandparents' burial site there in Winter Park. And it's, just, it's, it's, it's just a humbling moment just to go into a graveyard and then to see the family name and to look down and to see the dates. My grandpa died 
when he was 84 and my grandma when she was 92. That encouraged me a little bit, seeing how the DNA came on down, you know. <laughs> but you know, we don't like to talk about death. But of all the things in this room, it's the only thing all of us have totally in common. We're all going to die. And you know, Joshua knew just exactly what he was going to say that day. What are you going to say that day? You know, for us that are disciple, the end of days here is not the end of our days. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Paul writes in verse 15. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I'll tell you a mystery. We'll not all sleep, but we'll be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable is clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that's written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the church said, Amen. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. If we as disciples would understand that every word of God, every promise of God comes true, we would live our lives totally differently. We talk about death because death is certain and it's the greatest transition point that we'll ever experience. Will be changed. Every single sold out disciple will be changed in a twinkling of an eye. And we will be with the Lord, the Ancient of Days. And what's exciting is to think that not only do we cleave to the Lord in the most perfect way in heaven, but every person of faith will also be there. You know, it's going to be cranking to see. The people in this fellowship up there. Amen, guys? It's, it's going to be cranking to see Peter and James and the whole gang in the first century. And you know, we even get to see Joshua. Now, I don't know if it's going to be the younger Joshua that went into the promised land. Or the guy that was the general that led the conquering of the promised land. Or whether it'll be the old warrior. But it matters not. He'll be there. And you know, if that be true, and I believe it is, that everybody that knows God, that loves the Lord God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, gets to be in heaven, then what does this mean on earth? Well, it's what he says right here. He says, if this be true, that we'll be changed and twinkling by. We will be with God, the Ancient of Days. Well, therefore, stand firm. Let nothing move you, but always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. In other words, everybody you baptize gets to be with you up there with God. Man, now that makes your day worthwhile, doesn't it? Let me ask a question. How many studies were you in this week? Who did you study with? Did you live like that? Who have you tried to restore this week? There are so many fallaways out there. Did you live like that? If you believe the promises of God, you will always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. You know, I was very encouraged last week. 
Matt Sullivan down in Phoenix called me up and says, Bro, we got a new church in our fellowship in Curacao in the Caribbean. Of course, I'm sure a lot of disciples want to go there and minister to it. It's been pretty interesting. There's a couple that uh, led this church, a non-full-time couple named Michael and Maria Hart. And they, 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 they tried to build that church for a year, but lukewarmness got in there and kind of became all pervasive. And they followed what was happening in Portland. They followed what's happening here. And I said, listen, it's just time to get serious. Or in our terminology today, to renew the covenant. It's time to join a family of churches that is bent on conquest. Yeah. A family of churches that wants to evangelize the world. And so they asked Matt to come on down. And they called out the remnant. Now, they hadn't had a baptism for four years. Three weeks out of calling out the remnant, they had their first baptism, Claudette. Is that awesome? And Maria is going to be visiting L.A. tomorrow. Is that exciting? See, that's what can happen. That's what can happen. You know, while I was also down in Florida with Elena's uh, family get-together, I was able to also meet with two brothers whom I love very much, uh, George Grima and Jim Falkenberg. It was kind of cool. They're, they're in a congregation that, uh, bless their heart, it's, it's just been very hard. Uh, they've only had 20. It's a fairly large church. They've only had 20 baptisms this year, just two from the campus. That's it. And a lot of people were kind of like George and Jim. They were just sitting around waiting for something to happen. You ever been there? And they says, you know, that God, nothing's going to happen until we start trying to make it happen. So they got a genius idea. They started a Bible talk. <laughs> and there were 12 people, and they said, you know something? We know it's uncool, but we're going to have a goal in our Bible talk. <laughs> Since we're starting here in April, by faith, we're going to have a goal of baptizing six people by the end of the year. They just baptized their sixth person last week. Now their, their goal is to baptize another six by the end of the year. And they just split Bible talks. It's kind of cool because they said, yeah, last week we had the send off for the, other, the new Bible talk going out. Because see, not only were the six new disciples added, and they're all faithful. But 12 other people from the church had joined them. See, when people see the Spirit, they're going to go where the Spirit is. You know, it was exciting. As I was talking to Jim, I, I really didn't know his background. Well, he was in the Marines. He served in Vietnam. And then, shockingly to me, he, he was in a band called Mercy that in 1969 was a one-hit wonder. They had number one on the Billboard charts. Love can make you happy. <laughs> now today he's bald, but amen. You know. <laughs> Back then he was a pop star. But so here's a man that has gone through life. He's experienced much success in the military as well as in business. Not many of us can sing, let alone get a number one hit on the billboard charts. And you know what Jim is all about as he ages? Making disciples. Because the more a person ages, they realize that this life is short. And they've got to always give themselves fully to the work of the Lord. Because in that and in that only is your labor. Not in vain. You know, uh, I thought about it, standing there at the grave of my grandparents. 84, 92. That was their ages. I'm 53. Gives me 30 years. Just about a generation. It could be done. You see, guys, Joshua wanted to inspire those people. He brought him to Shechem to remember that God has always been faithful to his promises. Today, let us raise that stone under that old oak tree in our mind 
And let us remember the promises of God. And let us go into all the promised land that we call earth and evangelize it in our generation. Thank you, and God bless.